Our scripture from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. We'll read together the first nine verses. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shatim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I will show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. And the pattern of all the instruments thereof. Even so shall you make it. My theme this evening very simply is the presence of God meeting with the Lord. And if it is our desire to meet with God, the basic question, the most basic question that we can ask is where is it that God can be found? And the happy thing is that we don't have to wonder. We don't have to wonder where he is. We don't have to wonder where he will be to meet with his people. Prophet Amos asked the question, can two walk together unless they be agreed? He's not talking there about philosophical agreement one with the other, but rather he's simply saying, are two going to walk together unless they have made an appointment, unless they have prearranged that they're going to meet at a certain place at a certain time, and then they will travel together. You typically will not travel with someone, walk with someone, unless you have made prearrangements where to meet and so forth. And that's the idea here. And being and walking with God is not haphazard. It's not by chance meeting, by appointment. It's planned. And God never misses an appointment. He never fails to be where he says he is going to be. And if we are not conscious, therefore, of his presence, We're either in the wrong place or we're so taken up with other circumstances that we just fail to experience that divine presence. And either way is tragic. There are three times in the book of Exodus where God tells his people specifically, I will meet with you. I'll be there by appointment. And if you want to meet with me, this is where I'm going to be. And so in the time that we have together this evening around the word, I want us to look at these three different texts in Exodus, where God tells his people in this particular place, I will meet with you. All of this is associated with the tabernacle. The tabernacle was that object lesson of spiritual truths that God had given to the people in that dispensation. The tabernacle was the place of visible worship, of corporate worship. It was there at the tabernacle that God was teaching the people what true holiness was. It was there at the tabernacle that God was teaching the people what fellowship with him would look like and what worship was all about. And it's interesting that one of the several different expressions or phrases that are used to identify the tabernacle. It's the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting where God would congregate, where God would meet in fellowship with his people. And so as we look at these texts, I want us to realize that God is giving us here object lessons, something to look at, that we might learn spiritual truth. We don't have the tabernacle anymore, but we can still look at the picture and still get the truth, the point that God is giving to us. The first place we're going to read of in 
Exodus chapter 25, beginning at verse 10. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without thou shalt overlay it, and thou shalt put a crown of gold above it. He goes on in the following verses here to give other instructions as to how the Ark of the Covenant was to be constructed. At verse 16, and thou shalt put into the Ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. Now here's our text. And there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. The ark of the covenant. And the lesson that I want us to learn here, first of all, is that God meets his people at the place of propitiation. The ground of meeting with the Lord is always the ground of the atonement. Now remember the construction of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was in three different divisions, tripartite division. You have first the outer court. And in that outer court, the population in general could gather. It was there in the outer court that you had the altar followed by the laver. And I say in the outer court, as you made your way toward the presence of God, there was the entire congregation that could there enter in. But then you had the holy place. And in the holy place, you had the lampstand and you had the table of showbread. You had the altar of incense. And in that holy place, it was only the priests that could enter in. And it was there in the holy place that the priests would conduct their daily operations, their daily business. And then there was the veil, that thick curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place, the holy of holies. And in that secluded dark place, that holy of holies, there was but one piece of furniture, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. And God brings us here to the very heart of things. He brings us into that innermost sanctuary to teach some very important lessons as to what we must understand if we are going to meet with the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant was just a piece of furniture. Nothing magical about it, nothing mysterious about it. It was just a box. The Ark of the Covenant was just a box, overlaid with gold, other decorations as we will see upon it, but it was just a box. It was not the presence of God. Oh, there were later those in Israel that became so superstitious that they thought the Ark was a talisman, a lucky charm that they could take into battle. But that was not the presence of God. It was simply a manifestation, an object lesson of the presence of God with his people. Something that they could see visibly. But God was not in that box. God was not that box. But I say in the object lessons and the symbolism of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant became that climactic picture of the presence of God with his people. We've read something here of what the fox looked like. It was overlaid with gold. That speaks to us certainly of the majesty of God. It speaks to us of the sovereignty of God. The psalmist says, using the imagery here of the ark, that the Lord reigneth, and he sits between the cherubims. The ark here represents the very throne of God. The place of his rule, the footstool but the sovereignty of God. 
And that's one of the lessons that we must learn right up front, that if we are going to enter into the presence of God, we are coming into the presence of that one who is the King of Kings, and that one who is the Lord of Lords, that one who is absolutely supreme. The rich gold speaks certainly of the majesty. And to come, I say, into the presence of God, we're coming into the presence of that one who is the King. That demands, therefore, a humble submission. That demands, therefore, that we bow down to his authority. There's no place for self-willed rebels. There's no place for those that would exalt themselves in God's presence. No, to come into the presence of God, to meet with God, we must know that we are coming into the presence of a king. That demands fear that demands caution, referred to in the prayer, words of the preacher in Ecclesiastes, that we are to remember that God is in heaven, that we're upon the earth, the king. This would seem to be impossible. How can we? How can we that are just so low have access into the presence of this one who is the king. I don't have the credentials to enter into the office of the president of the United States. I don't have the credentials. I don't have the credentials just to go into the office of the governor of Michigan. I don't have the credentials just to knock on the door of the mayor of Grand Rapids. I have no credentials. And here's this one that is the king of all, the one who has made all. What hope do we have to enter into his presence? What credentials might we have that can bring us into the presence of this one who is the king? It seems at first, the ark, to suggest that there's no way. But then we see something of the holiness of God. For they were to make two cherubims. And these cherubims were to stand guard, as it were, over this box, over this object lesson of God's presence. The cherubim, one of the angelic creatures, host that God had created. All the angels are ministering spirits, the angels of divine providence. We have different classes of angels that are mentioned. The seraphim, they're those heavenly throne attendants. But the cherubim, almost every time, almost every time we read of the cherubim in the scripture, they are associated with the presence of God, with the holiness of God. The first time we see them, man has now been, because of his sin, expelled from paradise. And God stations the cherubim there at the entrance of paradise with their flaming swords to keep man out now of that sacred place. Guardians of the holiness of God. We see the cherubim in that strange, mysterious vision of Ezekiel in chapter 1 by the river Kabar. As he saw those living creatures with the four faces and the wings that were touching each other. Strange. But when Ezekiel refers to that vision later in his prophecy, he identifies those living beings specifically as the cherubim. Those angelic beings there that were associated were the guardians and the proclaimers of the holiness and the majesty of God. I say almost every time we see the cherubim, we see them associated with God's presence and with God's holiness. And now on this box, this Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim are there. This box that speaks to us of the manifest presence of God with his people. And now the cherubim are there as guardians of that. How can we come? How can we come? The psalmist says that only those that have clean hands and pure hearts can come into the holy place. Who are we? The holiness of God testifies to our natural inaccessibility to God. This one that reflects glory and is the unapproachable presence. 
Oh, to come into his presence demands that cleanness of hands and that purity of heart. And again, it seems to be sore foreboding. How can we? How can we that are so innately sinful come into the presence of God? It appears to be impossible. And then we see the righteousness of God. For the Lord told Moses, I want you to put the testimony, the Ten Commandments, the tables of the law inside the box. You put the tables of the law, the testimony, inside the box. This law of God that declares the absolute righteousness of God. This law of God that is inflexible. This law of God that is unchangeable. This law of God that is unsympathetic to any violations of it. A fixed law. Demanding righteousness. God demands righteousness. Righteousness is the conformity to whatever the standard is. And here is the standard of God's moral law, the very being of God himself. You put that in the box. This box that calls, therefore, for righteousness. If we are to enter into the presence of the Lord. The breaking of the law demands death. The wages of sin is death. What hope do we have? Here's God that is sovereign. Here's God that is holy. Here's God that is righteous. And with that box left open, with that box left open, there's the law of God that calls forth man's condemnation for the breaking of that law. I say so far as the box is left open, there's no hope. There's the tension, where can God be found? But there's one more component. For the Lord says, I want you to put now over the ark a mercy seat. You'll make this mercy seat. Literally, it's the lid of atonement. The lid of atonement. Here's the box, majestic, holy, calling for righteousness. And so far as the box is left open, there's no hope. And God says, I want you to put a lid on that box. You put a lid on that box. We're going to call that lid the lid of atonement, translated the mercy seat. The place where the blood would be sprinkled. And the lesson becomes clear here that God dwells with his people. He says, there at the mercy seat, it's there I will meet with you. God dwells with his people only by virtue of atonement. Remember where the ark is? In that solitude, in that dark place, that foreboding place behind the veil. No one could enter. Not the priests. Not the people. But only the high priest. Only the high priest and on but one day of the year. And never without the blood of the sacrifice could enter into that place. Only in the day of atonement. Oh, what a drama of redemption. What a drama of redemption that we have on that day of atonement. You read of it in Leviticus 16. Every day of life, every day of life, the high priest would be dressed in all of the royal garments of his majestic office with the breastplate, with the ephod, with the turban declaring holiness unto the Lord, with the bells and the pomegranates on the skirts of his garment. And every day of life, every day of life, the high priest would, as it were, parade through the congregation of Israel, and they would see the glory of that one who was the mediator. But on the day of atonement, on the day of atonement, the high priest would strip himself 
of all of that royal garment. Take it off. Set it aside. And now in the simplicity and in the humiliation of his linen undergarments, he would take the blood of the slain goat and enter into that place behind the veil. And there in the most holy place where was the Ark of the Covenant, that manifest, climactic demonstration of God's presence, he would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice. And then he would exit. And then he would exit and put on once again all of the garments of his glory and of his majesty. The humiliation was done. The blood had been shed, the blood had been applied, and now the blood was accepted. And he exits. And all the impediments to God's presence was now removed. There's reconciliation made. The blood covers the mercy seat, and all was well. It was the blood that comes between the holy righteousness of God and the holy law of God, and it quieted the law's cry for death. The mercy seat. And the Lord says there at the mercy seat, I'll meet with you. Now that's the picture. That's the picture. And what's the point? Oh, the point is so very clear, isn't it? For everything that the mercy seat is, is realized in Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 3, Paul speaks of Christ as the propitiation. And the word that is used there in the Greek New Testament, calling Christ the propitiation, is the same word that the Greek translation of the Old Testament uses to translate the mercy seat. Christ is the mercy seat. He is the propitiation. And everything that the ancient box pictured, Jesus Christ is. You think of the whole life of Christ, the whole ministry of Christ, is it not so pictured for us? On that day of atonement, leaving glory, leaving that place where for eternity he was hearing the seraphim, And their chorus of holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. But he left that ivory palace. Stripping himself, as it were, of all of the robes of his royal garment. His glory. And now in his simplicity. In the veil of his flesh. Humiliation. He obeys the law of God, satisfying the law of God. And becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, presenting his blood. Hebrews tells us that he presented that blood, not the blood of goats and bulls, but his own blood presented. The evidence of his atonement presented in the immediate presence of God. But then he exits, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There's the humiliation. There's Christ working, as it were, in his linen undergarment. But up from the grave he arose. Exaltation. And now the earned exaltation. And how does Paul put it? having become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The work of Christ. Were it not for Christ, were it not for the cross of Christ, God would be forever inaccessible to us. But in Christ and through Christ, through the blood of the sacrifice, through the cross of Christ, We have access to the Lord. And to put Moses here in our New Testament theological terms, the Lord says, you get to the cross. 
You get to the cross, and there, I will meet with you. The place of propitiation, the ground of the atonement. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. And if you miss that, if you miss that, you miss forever the possibility of ever knowing anything of the presence of God, the place of propitiation. Our next text comes from Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29, our attention now is going to be upon the altar in the outer court. First part of the chapter describes the construction of the altar, but now beginning at verse 38, our attention is particularly upon what takes place at that altar. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening. Further instructions. The end of verse 41, we find that this is to be for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And this shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Here's our text, where I will meet you, to speak unto thee, and there I will meet with the children of Israel. And the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. The second place God says to his people, I will meet with you, is this. God meets his people at the place of consecration. The place of consecration. There are conditions here, ethical demands for those that are going to meet with God. Let's look at the picture. Our attention here is drawn to that altar and particularly the burnt offering, the whole burnt offering, which is being described for us here. There were two broad categories, remember, of sacrifices in the Levitical system. Those that were for propitiation and expiation particularly, and then those that were for consecration. This is called a sweet savor offering. A smell that placates. An offering that created a smell that placates. A smell that was pleasing unto the Lord. And our attention here is on the whole burnt offering. Not taking the time this evening to review all of the peculiarities of each of the different offerings and sacrifices. They each one had certain things in common with the other, the selection of the animal, the laying out of hands, the slaying, and so forth. Various things in common. But the whole burnt offering had this unique feature. On the whole burnt offering, the entirety of the sacrificial victim was placed upon the altar and there it was consumed. There were some sacrifices that the priest got a portion. There were some sacrifices where the one that brought the offering got a portion. But of the whole burnt offering, the entirety of that sacrifice was placed upon the altar and completely consumed on the altar. Everything, nothing held back, nothing withheld. Everything was placed there on the altar and now consumed. And as the smoke and the incense, as it were, of that would waft its way heavenward, the Lord says, that smells good to me. That smells good to me. It's a sweet savor offering. The burnt offering was every day, twice a day, constantly. But it becomes a picture. It becomes a picture of putting everything upon the altar. And it's amazing that the Lord says, that smells good to me. Can you imagine? We read this so easily, don't we, when we read Leviticus and we can be comfortable where we're reading and 
read it here, Exodus. But what would it have been like to have been there in Israel with the camps around the tabernacle? What would it smell like if you were downwind and all this burnt offering, all that going on the, for us, it would have been the stench of those burning carcasses. Wouldn't smell good to us. But the Lord says when everything there is on the altar, when you put everything upon that altar, keeping nothing back, after the propitiation has been made, it smells good to me. And the Lord says, there, I will meet with you at the place of consecration. Now what's the point? Well, it certainly ideally speaks of Christ once again. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 that Jesus is that perfect, sweet savor unto the Lord. And who more than Christ himself lived a life of total and perfect consecration and dedication to the will and the purpose of the Father? Oh, ideally it speaks of Christ and all that he accomplished for the salvation of his people. But it speaks to us as well. It speaks to us as well that have been redeemed by that sweet savor of the offering of Christ. What we owe. What we owe. Second Corinthians chapter 5, as Paul reaches the climax of his personal accounting of his career, of his mission, of his ministry. Remember, Paul had been impugned by his critics. His authority was undermined. His integrity was questioned. And so in 2 Corinthians, he's defending his apostleship. And in chapter 5, he reaches the climax of that personal self-defense. And we learn what it is that made him tick. And he says in one place that it's the love of Christ that constrains me. It's the love of Christ that hems me in, that has arrested me, making all things new and old things passed away. But he argues this. The love of Christ constrains me, it arrests me, it hems me in. But having judged this, he says, having judged that this one died for all, Christ, how then can they for whom he died live unto themselves? How can they live with a view to themselves? How can they live with self-interest? How can they live with their own self-agenda? If they become conscious, if they become overwhelmed as Paul was, that he was living life looking through the prison bars of the gospel of saving grace. How can you do that? How can you live under yourself in view of what Jesus has done? Same argument in Romans. First part of Romans describes for us the many benefits of the gospel. Here we are condemned, but there's a free justification by faith in Jesus Christ. And a life of holiness, sanctification by faith in Christ. And our adoption and our potential glorification. All of these grand gospel benefits described for us in the first 11 chapters of Romans. But then in chapter 12, what does he say? Therefore, therefore, in view of all of these gospel benefits, let us present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable, that is, which is our logical service. It's the logical thing to do. If we are overwhelmed with the reality of what Jesus has done, the sacrifice that he has made for us, how can we? How can we not? 
live for him? How can we not put ourselves on that altar, as it were, as that living sacrifice, holy, acceptable? God says, it smells good. It smells good to me. Oh, the burning of the flesh doesn't smell good to us. But you put it on the altar. Put it on the altar. Is this not the logic of the confession? Is this not the logic of the Heidelberg, right, that brings us to understand our misery? Yeah. And then the deliverance. And then the gratitude. Here's the gratitude. Having been delivered from the bondage of sin by the sacrifice of Christ, how can we not live in gratitude, in praise, in consecration unto the Lord. His consecrated life is not in order to get to God because rather that God has gotten to us by his grace. Propitiation first, that's where it starts. It starts at the cross. But in view of the cross comes the altar of consecration. And God says there, I'll meet with you. Third place we find in chapter 30. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Thou shalt teem wood, thou shalt make it. Verse 3, overlay it with pure gold. Further descriptions of this altar of incense. Verse 6, And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, here it is, where I will meet with thee. Our attention now is on the altar of incense. And the lesson that I want us to learn is this, that God meets his people at the place of prayer. He meets his people at the place of prayer. Here's the experience of meeting with the Lord. Get the picture. It's altar of incense. There's no question that it becomes a picture for us of prayer here. The psalmist says, let my prayer be set forth, directed before thee, as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Altar of incense, picture of prayer. Oh, many things that are important here. Materials. Again, the strength of it, the purity of it, the power of it. For this altar of incense was to be fueled by the coals taken from the altar back in the outer court. That brazen altar where the sacrifices were offered. The priests were to take the coals from that to fuel the altar of incense. Oh, that's suggestive, isn't it? That what fuels prayer is the sacrifice. What fuels the prayer is the atonement. We see something of the perpetuity of this incense. It was always to be going on. We're to pray without ceasing. That's the idea. But the thing that strikes me most for our meditation this evening is the location of the altar of incense. You'll put it before the veil. You'll put it before the veil that is before the ark, before the box of the covenant. Again, remember the tripartite division. We have the outer court, we have the holy place, we have the veil, and then we have the most holy place. The most holy place, there was the ark of the covenant, that manifest climactic demonstration of God's presence. And now the altar of incense is placed right smack up against the veil. The altar of incense was there as close, as close to the Ark of the Covenant as you could get this side of the veil. There it was. Right in front of the veil. And as the smoke as the incense of 
the altar would waft upward, making its way over into the very most holy place. Picture prayer. The point certainly is clear. It's through Christ. Again, it's through Christ that we have access to the presence of the throne of grace. Just as the fuel of the altar of incense was taken from the altar, so our logic in prayer is taken from the sacrifice. That's why we, pr- that's why we pray in Jesus' name, you know. The fact that we pray in Jesus' name is not just part of the little liturgical formula that we were taught to pray. No, there's a logic there, and that's the basis. We pray in Jesus' name because it's only in Jesus' name that we have a right to come, his sacrifice. So it speaks to us, certainly, of all of that. But what, again, strikes me here is that this prayer, the smoke of the incense, would take us into the very presence of God. It's interesting that in, in, in Hebrews, in Hebrews 9, is it? I think it's Hebrews 9. When, when the apostle is describing there the old tabernacle, and he talks about the tripartite division, and he speaks of the pieces of furniture and where they are, he comes to the most holy place. And he says inside the holy place was the incense and the Ark of the Covenant. Some come to that and say, Paul made a mistake. Paul didn't know what the division of the tabernacle was. and where the, No, he knew very well. And I think the point is not that the altar itself was there, but the effect of the altar. The incense was taken right smack into the very presence of God. I say this brings us to the experience of meeting with God. For it's in prayer that we take our desires to him. And in so many ways, in so many ways, prayer is the holiest act of the spiritual life. As our desires, our thoughts rise naturally like smoke, Burdens, our sighs, inexpressible groans, our words, taking us into the immediate presence of God. Why is it? Why is it then that prayer, if this be the holiest of our spiritual acts, why is it so hard for us? And perhaps I make a personal confession that applies to me and no one else. I don't know. I can read my Bible all day long. I can be engaged in study of the scriptures all day long with concentration, with excitement, with fervency, with attention. Do it all day long. But yet when it comes now to the place of prayer, the time of prayer, my mind begins to wander. I think of things that I haven't thought of in years. I get sleepy. Why is that? Maybe it's just me. But why is that? Why is it that that which brings us into the sweetest place of fellowship with God becomes the hardest of spiritual exercises? Oh, I think the devil knows that, doesn't he? Fights against us. Fights against us. An old saying, something goes right that the devil, nothing fears more than a saint on his knees, however that goes. A lot of truth. It's hard. It's a battle. But yet, it ought to be for us a place of sweet communion to draw near to him. And the Lord says, you come to this place. It's there. I will meet with you. I will meet with you at the place of prayer. James gives us the promise. Draw near to me, 
and I'll draw near to you. What a promise that is, isn't it? You draw near to me, the Lord says, and I'll draw near to you. Seek me, you'll find me. But while I say that's a promise, I find it so often a rebuke to my own heart and soul. If it is true, and it is true, that God will draw near to those that draw near to him, that means, and I must admit it, that at any given moment I'm as close to God as I want to be. It's not that God is not where he says. God says, I'm going to be here. Here's where I am. Here's where I am. You want to meet with me? Here's where I am. So if I'm not there, if I'm not meeting with God, it's not because God is playing hide and seek with me. God doesn't play hide and seek with his people. You seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me. You draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Here I am. Here I am, the Lord says. I'll meet with you here. I'll meet with you at the cross. I'll meet with you at the place of consecration. I'll meet with you at the place of prayer. Lord, do meet with us. And increase our desire, each one who know the Lord, who have been delivered from that estate of sin and misery. Increase our desire. Increase our expectancy. Here's our credentials. I said at the beginning, what, what, what credentials do we have to come into the presence of God? Our credentials are Jesus. Our credentials are Jesus. We come because of what Jesus has done. But because he has done what he has done and the success of what he has done, we have rights and we have the ability. Paul says that we have, in Jesus' name, through his blood, a royal introduction. A royal introduction before the throne of grace. God help us. Increase our desire to meet with him. Amen. Most gracious Lord, most gracious Lord, we... Come with thanksgiving for what thou hast done to make meeting with thee possible. Thou hast given to us thy son, the only redeemer, the only mediator. Lord, we pray that we might in our own mindset be overwhelmed with the reality of what Christ has done. That we might, like Paul, view life through the prison of the love of Christ. With old things passing away and all things becoming new and living unto him. And, O oh Lord, teach us to pray. Meet with us. Seal thy word to our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, closing hymn number 159, O oh Lord of hosts, how lovely, standing together as we sing.
Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. It is our prayer that the Lord would add his indispensable blessing to this ministry.